Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen uh, from London. I'm very sorry not to be with you, but very um, grateful to be invited to speak by the organisers and by Santen. I'm going to talk about not just about the Preserflow microshunt and its role in glaucoma surgery, but also a little bit around why there's a need for such a device and uh, the importance of low pressures in glaucoma surgery, um, a subject that's very close to my heart and also I know uh, to yours. I work with a, a number of companies in my various roles, not just as a surgeon, but also running innovation meetings and uh, glaucoma symposia. So I work with pharma companies and device companies, and uh, th I, these are listed here. It's perhaps most useful to start with uh, the unmet need and target pressure. And uh, I know that I'm talking today to a lot of surgeons who are specifically uh, very experienced at trabeculectomy and glaucoma surgery and they may feel that uh, they know very well what the co concept of target pressure is but there are uh, there are, there is an unmet need and uh, while for many years a pressure level of 21 millimeters of mercury was widely regarded as satisfactory uh, though not by everyone at the time specifically Paul Chandler and Morton Grant in 1960 famously worked out that eyes with advanced cupping required pressures below the average of the population. But whether or not you believe in the term target pressure, every treatment has a target or a desired endpoint, and we all know this. And although many people for many years have accepted 21 millimeters of mercury as satisfactory, it's, it's obvious to all of us now that this is not the case. But where I'm going with this really is that proponents of less invasive procedures have for years argued that a low target pressure is not required. It has been claimed that in the advanced glaucoma intervention study, any pressure of less than 18 was enough to prevent progression. And this statement is fundamentally wrong. The Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study, which now was published 22 years ago, but still is a useful reference point. Uh, even though it was a post hoc analysis that came up with the um, evidence that low target pressures prevented progression, this claim has come from uh, eyes, with, that eyes with advanced damage, a mean deviation of around 10, had no average progression in eight years of follow up if the pressures were consistently less than 18. So it's sometimes quoted then that you, you can have a pressure of 17 and you're okay. However, in that particular study, the average of those achieving consistently less than 18 was actually 12. And at 12 millimeters of mercury average, the risk of a three decibel and mean deviation progression was actually 13%. So even at 12, the progression rate is finite. It, it's it, it's not nothing, uh, it's not high. And it's worth pointing out that those with um, pressures in the mid teens, it was around 30%. And at 20 millimeters of mercury, it was around 70%. So you can see there's a graded reduction in the risk of progression, the lower the pressure you get to on average. So it's not a matter of just being less than 18. And I think most of us know this, but there is still the, the um, the idea out there that you can get them below 18, you're fine. And, and this is not, not the case. When is this important? Well, it's much, much more important in this sort of individual because if the um, if there's any progression at all, the risk of, of vision loss is high. The, ri the risk of progression may be low if the pressure is 10 or 11 or nine, but should any progression occur, the risk to vision is high. If the pressure is running in the mid teens with a 30% progression rate or 20 with a 70% progression rate risk, this patient's in trouble. So we, we see patients for 20 years or more sometimes. And so a, a finite risk of 30% at, at eight years is significantly more than that beyond eight years. So we need to get lower pressures. I must point out that for practical purposes, advanced glaucoma also includes those with central or paracentral vision threatening visual field defects. Because if these patients get a little bit worse, they may also lose central vision, like the patients with advanced uh, visual field loss. 
So from my point of view, that the high risk group are those who we cannot afford and whom we cannot afford to wait to see progression because if they do progress, they're in trouble. And these are typically the types of patients who need surgery. So what is the unmet need in glaucoma today? It, it's really those who are progressing with central field loss or, or advanced vi visual field loss. Those with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery. And those with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery with very high pressures. Three different finite groups, and I, I like to consider them separately. And uh, traditionally, for those progressing with advanced central uh, with central field loss or advanced field loss, we always did trabeculectomy, and for many of them, it's still the best option. But for those with less advanced disease, we did trabeculectomy and cataract surgery, and those with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery in very high pressures, uh, we also did trabeculectomy. Now, as you can imagine. For those who are progressing with central field loss or advanced field loss, trabeculectomy actually works very well. That's why it's stuck around after 50 years, even though it's a crude procedure. And we all know this. We know that trabeculectomy combined with cataract surgery for those who are not progressing who needed cataract surgery is, is overkill and it's not elegant. We know for those with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery in very high pressures, that in fact, trabeculectomy really doesn't work in many cases and is a waste of time. Now, with a wide variety of new procedures, there are other options. Um, and the, the MIGS category, while not appropriate for the more complex ones, are certainly worth considering in the first two groups that I talked about. Um, and uh, we're all aware of the many types of procedures. But fundamentally, a lot of glaucoma surgical practices, cataract surgery, and here is uh, the, the latest uh, nuance in cataract surgery, the femtosecond laser uh, assisted cataract surgery, but the, you'd be very familiar with many advances in cataract surgery over the years, how much cataract surgery has improved and how precise it has become. The bulk of ophthalmic surgical training is cataract surgery. The bulk of surgery in glaucoma clinical practice is cataract surgery. And as we know, trabeculectomy and tube surgery are best suited to practices geared up for the intensity of work and who do a high volume and can deal with post-operative management. Because of the changes in cataract surgery, many trainees nowadays don't learn to suture and are unfamiliar with this type of surgery, making trabeculectomy challenging. And even in a number of uh, US programs, uh, trabeculectomy is, is, is not taught, which is a tremendous shame given that it is the single procedure that still gets the, the pressure lowest on average um, in patients with advanced glaucoma. So we're in danger of losing something important from our portfolio. So the question today really is, are there newer options that will at least uh, maybe not replace trabeculectomy, but come close uh, uh, to being equivalent to trabeculectomy? For those who are progressing with central field loss or advanced field loss. Tr traditionally, we've uh, had trabeculectomy, uh, but nowadays perhaps the subconjunctival MIGS procedures are also appropriate. For those with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery, I think this is really the, the preserve of the uh, internal procedures, the canal procedures, the, the stents and so forth, which are more modestly effective in terms of IOP lowering and perhaps not appropriate for those who really need a, a big pressure drop. And then there are those, of course, with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery in very high pressures where traditionally trabeculectomy has been done but doesn't really work. And these patients need tubes on, and specifically more refined tubes than we've had available to date. So what about the subconjunctival MIGs? Um, wh whether you call these MIGs, external MIGs, um, MIGs plus, whatever, it isn't uh, so important. Um, but these are f a form of external filtration and therefore do by nature have the potential for greater IOP lowering than Schlem's canal procedures. The Zen implant was the first and the Zen did show that it could, in certain circumstances and carefully selected patients, produce pressure lowering akin to a trabeculectomy. The Zen is an ab approach which was very attractive 
Um, but it, because it's an ab internal approach, you have little control over where it goes in the subconjunctival space. And there were uh, uh, significant bleb problems with that. And in fact, a number of uh, US colleagues who have routinely put in Zens via an ab external approach have reported fewer bleb problems afterwards. And the pressure flow micro shunt, which on the face of it to start with looks like a procedure that's more uh, has more similarity to trabeculectomy given that it's an ab external approach. But I'll, as I'll demonstrate, it has certain advantages uh, over the ab internal approach, e even though uh, th there's more cutting, so to speak. For surgeons who are familiar with trabeculectomy, the micro shunt procedure is not complex. The micro shunt is a fine polymer tube that drains aqueous from anterior chamber to subtenon space and it's implanted ab externo. The conjunctiva and tenons dissection are similar to those of a trab but unlike a trab don't need to be at 12 o'clock because the pressure flow drains more posteriorly and lid coverage over the bleb is therefore easier to achieve and the potential for bleb dysesthesia is less. I tend to go slightly temporally rather than nasally as bleb problems with trabeculectomy are more common with nasal positioning. Mitomycin is essential to prevent fibrosis. Good hemostasis is essential so that blood cannot negate the effect of the mitomycin. A large pyritomy facilitates posterior placement of the three LASIK sponges that come with the microshunt in the packet and these are soaked with mitomycin. After three minutes, the sponges are removed and the area irrigated copiously. I typically use 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 milligrams per mil of mitomycin for three minutes. The large pyritomy is actually quite useful and will be beneficial later when closing the tenons. Light scleral cautery is applied to the area of implantation and the area must be dried as you need to make a mark at three millimeters uh, behind the limbus, uh, starting at the posterior part of the limbus at the trans back of the transition zone. The marker and the ink actually come in the packet with the micro shunt, so everything is supplied. You see this one is a little more anterior, um, that is too far forward and we, we th there are these nuances are quite important. The, the mark really needs to be at the posterior part of the limbus rather than the anterior. Some uncertainty here. This one's not I not ideal, but not too bad. But as you can see, it's still not quite uh, at the back uh, of the transition zone. The one millimeter slit keratome uh, comes with the the micro shunt, and uh, the pocket is made at as far as the edge of the transition zone. Use a 25 gauge needle to enter the anterior chamber, and this usually needs to be bent in order to get the right access angle. Now, while this seems very simple, it is important to get it right. The needle is introduced the length of the pocket and tilted slightly forward to just enter the anterior chamber, just anterior to the iris. And you've got to be very careful not to distort the tissues because if you're forcing the tissues round, then they will recoil and the microshunt will be pointing towards cornea. So it needs to be a very gentle, clean stab um, it, with, without forcing the tissue into the angle that you want because you will not end up with a micro shunt in the same angle. You then remove the micro shunt from its packaging over the eye. It's easily flicked away, so be very careful that it's a very small device. And you feed it bevel up through the, through the pocket or tunnel and into the anterior chamber. And you, the fins on the side of the micro shunt are 1.1 millimeter uh, apart and those ensure that the micro shunt self retains. Nevertheless, it is important to ensure that the micro shunt is very correct, is correctly seated. Difficulty inserting can occur if the anterior chamber is over or under inflated. So you need to make sure that the eye is pressurized either via paracentesis or even just flushing through the tunnel. You also have to be careful that the needle entry site goes into the eye at the apex of the tunnel. Once the micro shunt is in, as it is hydrophobic, it sometimes needs some encouragement to drain and often I will press gently on the sclera, gently but firmly to ensure that it actually is draining. If you don't see any flow from the micro shunt, then it will not lower the eye pressure. Uh, the commonest cause for no flow is actually low pressure inside the eye and uh, you do need to pressurize the eye. 
but sometimes flow can still not be elicited, elicited even when the pressure is high. And you can uh, inflate the eye via paracentesis or here um, via the, the implantation tunnel, but you get the pressure up and then you should see some flow. If there's no flow, as in this case, even when the pressure is high, then you flush the shunt. Now the shunt can be flushed easily with this 23 gauge thin walled cannula that comes uh, uh, that, that is supplied by Santan and, and, and it is, is available. It doesn't come in the packet, but you can then see the flow in this case with fluorescein if you're not sure. But it should be visible without. If you're flushing, ensure the cannula is snug against the uh, micro shunt fins inside the pocket. Ensure that you're actually uh, flushing it tightly, otherwise the, the BSS will squirt everywhere. If at first you don't succeed, then do it again, because sometimes it takes two or three goes. Most of the time you'll be fine with one go, but sometimes you have to do more than one. And now you can see some flow. The amount of flow you see will depend on the pressure inside the anterior chamber. The pressure is high, the flow will seem quite brisk. If it's low, it'll be slower. If you don't have any cannula available, don't panic. You can use a regular 21 gauge. It's not ideal, and you can get some peri uh, you can get some flow coming around the outside of the tube with it. But it, it can be used if you're stuck, and it's better to get the shunt working than not get it working. When you're closing, it's very important to take care not to block the micro shunt with tenons. A large peritomy helps as the position of tenons relative to the micro shunt. Uh, uh, can be visualized more easily. So you, when you put in, you, you've got to pull the tenons up with the conjunctiva or suture the tenons separately, but you do need to take care of the tenons. Here I'm bringing the tenons up because it's loose and uh, you pull it snugly to the limbus or, or alternatively recess the tenons, but either way, look after the tenons. Eight days after surgery, the bleb is still red, but diffuse and the pressure is good. You can see these are quite posterior blebs. They, these are probably the most contact lens friendly blebs I've ever seen. That's five months later. And because they're posterior, uh, the incidence of discomfort and infection seems to be rare. I have seen exposure in, in, in one or two out of more than 200 cases, but uh, it, in fact, infection I have not seen and uh, discomfort is, is rare, unlike trabeculectomy where blebs close to the limbus can cause significant discomfort. So what's going on here? You can see the micro shunt's been inserted um, a millimeter or two to the right of the actual marks. Well, what happened here was that the original tunnel wasn't adequate. It couldn't get the micro shunt into the eye. What do you do then? Well, it's actually quite simple. You just make another tunnel. You've already got your marks. You don't necessarily need to mark again, but you take the slit keratome and make another tunnel and, and repeat the exercise. It's very simple. You can even do three or four. It's not ideal, but uh, if you do have these problems, it's not the end of the world. It's a very easy uh, fix. And in this case, you can see the micro shot just went straight into the second tunnel without a problem, whereas it, it kept getting stuck in the first, uh, perhaps, the, perhaps the needle entry site was a little anterior to the apex of the, of the pocket um, or, or something like that. Uh, overall, there are a few important, simple uh, procedural uh, tips that are useful. Slightly large peritomy. Um, mark the mark from the posterior part of the um, corneal scleral transition zone. Don't distort the tissues when you're entering the eye. Be very careful. Fit the micro shunt snugly, and uh, and ensure that you bring tenons forward and it's not occluding the micro shunt when you're closing up. If you can master these simple techniques. Uh, it's not a difficult procedure, especially for experienced surgeons, but there, but there are some important nuances. And the trainers, um, it, with all of the new devices, tend to be very, very aware of 
the common mistakes. And I think when we're learning as experienced surgeons, when we're learning these techniques, it's important to uh, to pay attention to what the trainers say because they really they they really see all the common mistakes. Here's a case. Here's a case where I would not have done a micro shunt. <clears throat> this is a 57 year old white American male diagnosed with primary open angle glaucoma in 2009, had LASIK in 2006, was referred to me in February 2014 with pressures of 16 in the right, 13 in the left at 11 in the morning on COSOP preservative free. Originally myopic, I'm not sure how much, uh, but with thin corneas, as you can see, 464 right, 454 left. And these were his visual fields in 2014. He did actually have quite significant glaucoma, as you can see, uh, worse in the right than on the left. And you can see from here that his visual field in 2018 was significantly worse in both eyes. He developed an inferior arcuate scotoma in the left and the upper hemifield defect in the right had become almost complete. So here is 2014 again, and here is 2018 again. And you, you will agree that there's been progression in both eyes. As I mentioned, the reason that I would not have done a micro shunt is that I, this patient has pressure in the mid to low teens already, or at least the mid teens. And he has quite a significant visual field loss. So I would have been reluctant uh, to consider a micro shunt as I felt that he needs to get a low pressure and I would prefer to do a trabeculectomy. Just to remind you, he's a 57 year old white American male and his referral pressure is 16 in the right, 13 in the left, but he does have thin corneas and he's clearly progressing in 2018 with pressures of 15 in the right and 13 in the left. And he's, on, he's now on four drugs. He was only on COSOP to start with. This patient is clearly progressing. He needs surgery. He needs a low pressure. I offered him a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, but he wasn't that keen. So I offered the Preserflow as a, as a close alternative. The patient chose the Preserflow. He underwent uh, left insertion uh, with uh, 0.4 milligrams per mil of mitomycin for two minutes in July 2018. At three weeks, uh, he was 11 millimeters mercury off medication, which wasn't bad, even although he does have thin corneas. So on the basis of a reasonable outcome at three weeks, we proceeded with the other eye. It's the, at that point in time, I was still experimenting a little bit with the duration and concentration of the mitomycin because I'd found that 0.2 milligrams per mil uh, just didn't seem to be enough. So initially I moved to 0.4 for two minutes, but uh, then uh, as time progressed, I've gone 0.4 and then 0.5 for three minutes um, because I seem to be getting better results. By the 28th of August, uh, a few weeks, four weeks later, he was 10 millimeters mercury in both eyes off medication. And you can see um, th these are his uh, left uh, pressures and uh, and at uh, that point in time uh, in November he was 10 millimeters mercury on the left on COSOPT and in the right eye uh, he was 5 millimeters mercury on nothing. These pressures are on the 4th of November a year later. So the left is 488 days after surgery and the right is 460 days after surgery. So basically 15 months later, this patient has got single digit pressures in the right with no medication and pressure of 10 in the left. Uh, and you can see uh, up above the, the graphs of the, um, the blue line is the starting pressure. The green line is the pressure during each follow up. The black line starting medications, the orange line is the medications at each follow up. And you can see how, how well the, the right eye is doing. The left is still doing well compared with the starting level. He's on two fewer medication and he's got a 30% pressure drop. What about the fields? Well, these were the fields preoperatively. 
and these were the fields 15 months later at that last follow-up that, that I alluded to. Um, you can see that there's been no change, albeit that's a short period of time and uh, you wouldn't expect any change in that time perhaps, and time will tell. This may not be low enough in the uh, left eye. Uh, this is the, the eye on the COSOP with a pressure of 10, but, you, but I don't think anyone would disagree that a pressure of five on no medication for this eye is not unreasonable. So he had a completely uneventful post-operative course, course with no intervention in either eye, other than the addition of topical medication on the left. Excellent diffuse bleb morphology, no post-operative morbidity, no dysesthesia, but it's too early to say if the fields are truly stable or not. And he does have thin corneas, so the true eye pressures are higher than the measured levels, and we will need to watch carefully. What efficacy data do we have? Well, this is a press release um, of the um, uh, microshunt versus trabeculectomy pivotal trial. Santen uh, are the only company to have done a prospective randomized clinical trial uh, of uh, a MIGS device versus trabeculectomy. In the study at one year, uh, the pressures dropped from a starting level of 21 millis mercury in both trabeculectomy and in focus arms to uh, 14 millis mercury in the microshunt arm versus 11 in the trabeculectomy arm. So yes, the trabeculectomy does get lower pressures, but the microshunt does also get significantly lower pressures than the starting levels, and they are below the, the mid-teens. So the average pressure with a microshunt, you can expect it to be around 14 millis mercury at a year, which, which I think is quite a, an impressive drop from a, 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 pre, a starting pressure in the low 20s, from an average of three medications at the start to 0.6 at one year. The low there is a slightly better pressure result in the trabeculectomy. The medication levels are very similar between the two groups at one year. In our international glaucoma surgery registry, um, now this was last, uh, these slides were last updated a year ago. Because of COVID, we have continued to operate, but it's been uh, it has been difficult to follow patients up. Basically, there's a lot, a lot of loss to follow up. But at that point in time, we had 258 microshunts on the registry, um, whereas uh, and 34 revisions. My impression is that with increasing the mitomycin dosage, the revision rate has dropped quite significantly, um, from a from a, to around 10%. And bearing in mind, I do not needle postoperatively unless there's a clear indication for needling. So I rarely needle, I tend to revise. Our anti-metabolite use in our registry was uh, roughly 37-38% um, at higher doses of mitomycin uh, at 0.5 milligrams per mil, at 30% at 0.4 milligrams per mil, um, 28% at 0.2 milligrams per mil. In the lens status were 65% um, phacic, um, but only 11% had concurrent cataract surgery. Um, so, and in general, like all types of filtration surgery, combining the mi microshunt with cataract surgeries probably causes lower efficacy. So I don't tend to combine them with cataract surgery, except in very elderly patients. The baseline topical medications, you can see the majority of patients are on three or four before surgery. Uh, and you can see the, the, the typical pressure levels in the registry. Uh, we're reaching, um, starting at pressures of 22 and reaching uh, just under 14 at three years. And a very dramatic drop in medication. Uh, the green bar is three years post-op. Post-operative complications are largely things like encapsulation, um, hyphema, because you are making a needle stick in, in, into the eye, but it's rarely very significant. Um, but overall, uh, no devastating complications in, in this registry data. Although you, it, is, it is worth pointing out that you can get hypotony. Hypotony is generally not serious. But if you have a patient who you think is particularly prone to hypotony, the microshunt is not necessarily a safer option. Hypotony can occur. And if you think that's going to be bad news for your patient, don't do the microshunt. 
Uh, it's rarely, very rarely devastating, but, but serious hypotony uh, can occasionally occur. As you can see from the registry data, 76% um, of patients almost had no post-operative intervention and 24% did. And the types of post-operative intervention you can see uh, vary from uh, a lot of that was post-operative topical medication, um, 5-FU injections, and we only had seven needlings out of 258 cases. So that's relatively low, although that may reflect the practice of the individual surgeons. The success rate at 12 months, um, uh, as you can see at top left is 21 millimeters of mercury or less, complete success at 64% almost. So if you're aiming for a pressure less than 21, you've got two thirds chance. If you're aiming for a pressure of 15, you've got about um, a 47% chance at off medication and about a 60% chance on medication. Now, if you're aiming for a pressure of the bottom right of 12 or less, then actually you've still got um, a 35% chance on or off medication. So as you go down the target pressure um, spectrum, you've got less chance obviously getting down below 12, but you've got a, a, you've got a roughly 60%, almost two thirds chance of getting below 15. And of those who needed further procedures out of the 258 on the registry, um, seven were tubes. Um, a number were revisions, as you can see, 21 had to either a further shunt or a revision of a shunt. The, those who had lower doses of mitomycin uh, did a little less well at 12 months uh, than those who had higher doses of mitomycin. And the, for, um, the top left is 21 millimeters of mercury or less low doses of mitomycin. Um, top right is high dose for the same target pressure. Down below is 18 millimeters of mercury at low dose to the left, high dose to the right. And again here, and, and particularly if you get down to 15 millimeters of mercury or, uh, or less, um, and the, these are the lower target pressure ones here. If you've got a higher dose of mitomycin, you could over 70% chance of getting a pressure below 15. So you can see if you're aiming for 15 or less with the higher doses of mitomycin, uh, you've got 70% chance of achieving that, which is pretty good. Um, although in the lower doses, it's not quite so good. And uh, if, But if you need a very low target pressure, 12 or less, you're still aiming for roughly 30, 36% chance of getting there um, with the micro shunt and high dose of mitomycin. And uh, overall, you can see the higher doses had a mean pressure out at three years of less than 12 um, uh, on average uh, on or off medication. And the lower doses, it, it was uh, apart from the, 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 the one at four years, which was 17, which I think was only one patient, the, the green bar is, is closer to 14. And topical medications, there actually wasn't much difference, uh, but they were slightly higher. Uh, again, at three years, 0.67 and the low doses of mito, 0.25 and the higher doses of mito. Ignore the, the one on three medications at four years in the, the bottom graph. So pressure flow microshunt efficacy approaches that of a trabeculectomy. It's not quite as low, but it approaches that. And it is the first MIGS type procedure to, to do that consistently without requiring a lot of uh, post-operative manipulation. Uh, bled morphology is one of the big advantages of the microshunt. You can see these very diffuse posterior blebs. You can just about see the microshunt on uh, retroillumination. And these are potentially very good for contact lens wear. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Most of those videos can be seen uh, on uh, some of my channels. Thank you very much for your attention. I believe we have some time for questions.